I'm going to use a verse of scripture, actually two, to make my point as I go through what I kind of think is a helping hand today, no pun intended. Two scriptures I'm going to use. Uh, one is out of John 3, 35, which is actually John the Baptist making a statement regarding Jesus, and the other one will be out of Matthew 11. So I'll let you spin with me first from John chapter 3 and verse 35. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. That's the first scripture I'd like to use. And to back this up, because this is John the Baptist saying this of Jesus, to back this up, turn to Matthew 11. Matthew 11, where Jesus says, 11.27, all things are delivered. That's the English, but the Greek reads, all things are given unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Some italics there for you. But they are both complementing each other in saying the same thing. That, first of all, I'm not going to get into a discourse today of trying to understand the fullness of the Godhead because we would need much more than an hour, and some of you would need a good dose of no dose, <laughs> or whatever it is, <laughs> Red Bull. But what I do want to highlight out of this is the Father, loving the Son, hath given all things into his hand, suggests to me, and out of Matthew's Gospel, the same concept, suggests to me, underscoring some ideas that run through Scripture, that if indeed the Father gave all things to the Son, and in John's Gospel, he says he and the Father are one, and he wants those that have been given to him to be one, I and them and they and me, just like I and the Father are one, suggests that the completeness, or as Colossians says, you are complete in Christ. I think what I want us to do is look at what is in his hand. What does he possess? And I want you to visually think about this. We often have referenced the child taking the father's hand, and it's not so much that the child is reaching up, but the father's grip is strong enough to take and hold the child and sustain the child. I want you to visualize today what may be lacking as you reach out to Jesus. And that is some small points, what I would say simplistic but small points, that will give us something to hold on to. And when you look back at this message, you may say, what I gleaned out of this is that maybe I have been treating God's love to me or understanding God's love and what is invested within that love toward me as one-dimensional, and God is not one-dimensional. So, in the scriptures we're told that we are co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs that means we shall inherit. Whatever he inherits, we shall inherit. And we start our journey with understanding that Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. And if we're looking at what God has given, God the Father loved the Son. He placed all things in his hands. The first thing he's placed in his hands is a kingdom. The second thing is the population for the kingdom. Now, I think a lot of people, when they read Scripture and they read things like, the meek shall inherit the earth, and that sounds great, but there's a greater inheritance than inheriting the earth, the inheritance that's in Christ. The things that we try and pick apart, because this is, all this is not my message. This is just background for my message to show what measure of love this is, which 
when you weave it all together, you say, well, that's a lot put into God's love. But using this text, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand, the first thing that I want to highlight is we'll call it the evidence through Scripture of these, what I'm referencing, all things. The definition of all things is all things, things that are in heaven, things that are on earth, things that we think are beyond our realm, and things that are, frankly, just right in front of us. Now, what is the all things in his hand? I'm going to make it easy and start with the easiest one so you can see where I'm going to weave a pattern. Say if we were talking about the needs of the saints, and I said this is the easiest one. The needs or wants of the saints. Often quoted is that scripture out of Philippians, my God shall supply all your need. You've heard that quoted to you. But most of the time, people are taking you down a certain path with that. I want you to think that if indeed God is able to supply, it means he has in his hand all that could be needed, provided, dispensed. I want you to think about this because I'm not taking you down some crazy path, but rather the needs and wants of the saints. If I were talking about temptation, and I've quoted many times, he knows how to deliver the righteous. But a lot of times we talk about our needs or our wants, and that's in the context of the tangible and the things that we'd like to put our hands on. But how about the things we'd like to get our hands off? to resist something. He is able, because all things have been placed in his hand, he is able to deliver. Romans 16 and verse 20 says that he will crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will do this. And all of these that I'm quoting are rooted in something. Do we really trust, this is going to sound so awkward that I'm saying this, do we really trust God? I'm asking you to do a little thought stirring inside yourself as well because a lot of times people reduce God down to the simplistic idea, something that is repeated, and we really don't have to hang our beings on what God says. We just go through life going through the motions, and I think a lot of people think that suffices. But if you believe what I'm quoting, the Father loveth the Son, given, him all, given all things into his hand, what are the all things? All things may be, as I said, need or want. All things may be wisdom. When you read the scripture and you read that all wisdom is in him, he is indeed the treasure, the hidden treasure. And every dimension of God, I think, leads us back to the same place, what's in his hand. Do or could I ask the person I was talking to early in the week, does God have a closed fist in your mind or does he have an open hand? Because I think that's the way a lot of people perceive. God has all these great things we read about in the Bible, but it's, it's not open to you. Now that's called frustrating God's grace. It's not open to you. He'll do it for somebody else, but he won't do it for you. But let me ask you a question. Are you better or worse or the same than the prodigal son that when he came to his senses, the scripture says it was told there's bread enough to spare in his father's house? Or does your idea of what all things in the son's hand consist of mean that there's maybe not enough to go around? I want this to be thought-provoking before I actually get to what I'm going to speak on because all of these things, if the father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand, tells me all wisdom is given into his hand, all knowledge and understanding. When people talk about their specific relation to God, those, it says, who are needing to be clothed, who are naked, he clothes them. 
put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are hungry, he feeds. Those who are thirsty, he gives to drink. In every dimension, you are going to be looking at what I call the promises of God, we've said here. But those are the veins through which the blood of Christ flows to that nail-pierced hand. And I think many times people make these disconnects. I'm claiming the promise over here, but I don't realize what life must flow through these promises, the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm reaching for his hand today. I hope you'll be doing the same thing and understanding there's an application of this. And I really now know why this was put so deeply in my mind. We could talk about if God the Father placed all things in his hand, as I said, wisdom and knowledge, righteousness. We could talk about every dimension. And we get down to the attribute of love. We could talk about the fact that the greatest love put on display by Christ, and please hear the spirit of what I'm going to say, because this is what, this is at the bottom of all this. It says that Christ went to Samaria. He must needs go to Samaria, King James says like that, John 4, 4, to meet a woman, one woman, to put himself in danger, it wasn't his time to die, to meet one woman who was such a vile sinner. Now, it doesn't say she was a harlot, but she had the behavior of one. She had many men in her life. He even says, the one you're with now is not your husband. What manner of love do you see in Christ? I've just told you something that to me is very significant. In his love of a fallen creation, there was also his infinite wisdom and seeing of the future that this woman would be at the well. He knew exactly why he was going to Samaria. I think some of you, this is not just a blanket statement. I'm talking about some of you that I've had conversations with or I've read your letters. Some of you don't realize that Christ makes these detours to the off places to meet the off people. What is your or my objection? I don't have any, by the way. But some out there do. Christ didn't come to call the righteous, but he came to call the lost sinners to repentance. That requires, if you're reading the same passage I'm reading, that the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. It also give, gave Christ the ability to say, whosoever he will call into his kingdom. Kingdom not of this world, whosoever he will call into his church, Ephesians 1.22. And sometimes I think we, we miss that dimension of God's love. We want to say, God, God loves me so much, he died for me. Yes. But don't miss the dimension of God's love in knowing certain things about finding you just where he did. And there are people who are listening to me today who have listened here, but they have never really understood never really committed their way, never really mentally reached for that hand that has all things in it. Beginning with, Lord, help me up. I, I can barely stand. You know, there's people, I'm sure, that turn on the TV and they're so weak in spirit. The scripture says, he gives. He gives strength. He gives power to those who are faint. And he gives strength to the weak. I misquoted that, but that's Isaiah 40. He, he, when you are at that point, it is looking at what's in his hand. You know, we sing the song, it's a child song. Most kids learn it in Sunday school. Put your hand in the hand of the man that still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man that calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself, and you will look at others differently. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. All right, you sing that. But when the full force of life comes, 
this is one of those things that I think if the Father hath given all things into the hand of the Son, then whose hand are you reaching for? Now, you can't touch, you can't feel, but faith reaches up there. Faith reaches for that hand. Now, if that sick woman stretched out her arm to just merely touch the hem of his garment, I think, and that was just his garment, and we have much more understanding, mentally by faith reaching out to grab his hand, which possesses all things, gives me a knowledge of his love beyond just, come here, I want to give you a hug. We all have, I've said this before, we all have the prodigal problem. Don't think you read the Bible and it's just some, it's some one parishioner that disappeared and came back. We all have that. You may not journey off into a far country that far away, but this is the freeway, and this sometimes is not the 405. This is like the Autobahn. <laughs> Things are going by so quickly. We talk about our attention span. How many times have you tried to sit down and read or pray, and it's in that time when you decide you're going to read or pray that the phone starts ringing or somebody needs you, or you've got to go to the bathroom? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Now, I, I just want to tell you that part of all this was brought about because I think a lot of times we just think of God's love in one dimension. We think about, yes, I'm, I'm a fallen, disgraced person, but he went to the cross and he loves me so much and therefore he loves me. But I'd ask you it a different way and in a daily way. Are you feeling as though the guilt and the shame of your sin or your sinning condition has overcome you? And you go to the fountain where Jesus' blood never dries up, and always washes you clean? Are you feeling rejected? I mean, I, we could go through every dimension, and each one of these leads me back to what the Father has placed in the Son's hand. I know that for some, if we just talked about knowledge, the knowledge that's in His hand, unfortunately, a lot of times people think, well, if I can just gain knowledge in the worldly sense, that suffices. But I love what Paul says out of Philippians. He says, it's all loss, it's all dung, except for the excellencies of the wisdom of Christ, the knowledge of Christ. If you understand, you may have a lot of knowledge about things, but without Christ, it's like having a bunch of zeros without a number before it makes nothing. You can repeat that later. What I love about this is if you read immediately the verse that follows, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. In Christ's hand lives eternal life. And I don't say it lives there. I mean simply put, if I were trying to explain to somebody how much God loves us. It's not the back-slapping, fuzzy stuff that happens in most churches. That's man-made stuff. That's stuff that if you wake up and you have a bad day, you might not be so back-slapping, gummy bear happy. God is God, and the Scripture says, I'm God and I change not. It's not a fluctuating love depending on God's inner compass. If he thinks that I was really, really good today, he's going to love me just a little bit more. These are things, by the way, you might think, well, why am I saying this? Because these are common things being preached almost on a regular basis instead of understanding what does this love look like in Christ. And I've also said many times, quoting out of Philippians, though Richie became poor, he condescended all of these are in his hand. The concepts are not, and I pray this church, I pray you as listeners hear what I'm saying. Because all that I'm saying right now, I'm just randomly throwing concepts out regarding 
what the all things are, whether it's knowledge, whether it's uh, his righteousness, his holiness, whatever it is that you want to see, it is all things, it is heaven and earth. It encompasses everything, all manner of provision, all manner of love, even the love that is the love that must rebuke and chastise you. You ever hear that preached? Except for here, I think we're the only church that tells you whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he trains. Child training. Well, how do you train a child? Usually it's by much discipline, except in the present age we live in. <laughs> so, all of this is background. If you think there are no people, there are, there's nobody in this church that thinks the way I'm, I'm, what I'm going to say, you're terribly mistaken. There are even people here, and I, I don't really know, I don't want to say I fault them. I, I fault the fact that they have been looking too much inside themselves and not enough looking to Christ. But there are people in this church, in this sanctuary this morning, and listening to me on radio and on TV or Internet, thinking they are the exception that all things may be in Christ's hand, but Christ has closed his hand to them, and all they see, essentially, is a closed hand. Not even, by the way, we, we don't believe, and I do not believe the nail piercings, they're placed a little bit lower, but I'm using this as a figure of speech, that if they were really seeing the open hand of Christ and all things in that hand, they would also be seeing that the price to buy all things came through those nail piercings at the cross, and it was not for naught. Now, the love of God, as seen in Christ, turn to John 4.4. 4. All that was background to show you, and there are a few of these we'll look at briefly. If all things are in Christ's hand, it means that now, I don't believe everything's wound up, but providentially, he says, he must needs go through Samaria. Why? It was dangerous. Much animosity and contention for him to go there. But he went all for one woman, and not a righteous woman. I pray this church, I really, what everybody else does, frankly, I can't change the world. I'd like to, but I can't. But I pray this church gets it right and gets it straight. There are no degrees like this one, this particular vignette of God's love in his infinite wisdom, in his knowledge of where his children are, even when they are not yet his children, but they are his children. He spoke their name before they came into existence that we would not come to the idea that sin is measured by degrees. Like somehow, this woman was so bad, but there are other people who are less bad on the scale, and therefore the ones who have been less bad, well, they're greater recipients of God's love. He loves them more because they haven't been as bad. And if you think that way, you haven't read the Bible. And if you think that way, you haven't understood about God because the pictures that I read about the people that God shows the greatest love towards that are spelt out for us here are the worst ones. And yet he doesn't measure them. He doesn't weigh them out. Because now, in standing after the cross, whether you've sinned by a little bit or sinned by a lot, we're all trapped in the sinning condition. And then there are the sins that we commit all the time. So I pray I don't have a church of pharisaical hypocrites. And I'm, I'm your pastor, so I'm just going to say it like it is. I pray to God I don't have a church of pharisaical hypocrites that says, well, I never did anything like that. And by virtue of saying that, you just did. By virtue of thinking that, you just did. Here's this woman coming to draw water. Let me go back to read at verse 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Shechar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. 
Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now, you know, for the average person reading this who doesn't care to understand what is, what has been given into the hand of the Son, and I'd have you notice it's hand singular, right hand of power, hand, is the knowledge to know right where you are. You know, he didn't go to Samaria because he was thirsty. Yeah, you know, we must needs go to Samaria because there's some good water there. <laughs> there's a few of you here that are really wrestling, and I don't know, I don't understand this. This is one thing I, I don't understand. When you read this, he went just for her. He has come just for you. Why is that so hard to wrap your mind around? Went out of his way. That's why I said, whatever other places are preaching, whatever message they're delivering, I want the ones that feel like, and there are some here, well, God will do it for others, but he won't do it for me. What kind of a God do you think you're worshiping? Well, he healed that person. We heard about that wonderful so-and-so, brother so-and-so. He got healed and delivered, and God did that for him, but he hasn't done a thing for me. Okay. He goes to Samaria, and as I've said, he didn't go because the water was so tasty. There cometh a woman of Samaria, an enemy, by the way. Bold, absolute enemy. It put... Please put this in the now. You know, we read these and we become so familiar. Please put this in the now. Somebody who you may encounter in your life who looks like a blatant enemy of the church, a complete turnoff, I hate the church, I hate your pastor. I want you to put some flesh on this. This is not just some little Bible story, as somebody used to say, which would drive me nuts. This is exactly the way Christ does things, knew where she was, knew at what time she'd be there. Next time you, you say nobody's looking, better think twice about that. <laughs> he knew she was going to be there at that hour, blatant enemy in hostile territory. He says, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She even knew there's no way. I think, again, put flesh and blood on this. Well, there's no way that Jesus would do this for me. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is, who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And I ask you today if, if you had fuller knowledge. And some of us do. We've been sitting in this church, some, some of you, for over 30 years, and still haven't completely, now I'm speaking to the one, still have not completely reached the point of Please don't come and tell me and bear your soul to me because bearing your soul to me is not going to do anything. But you still haven't taken the issues that have other ramifications attached to it before God to say, heal these issues. Lord, these are the things that are causing these other things in my life, and I can't, I can't fix them. I've tried to hide them. I've tried to run from them, but I can't. Speaking of the one now, but I'm sure there's a few that will have the benefit of spillover. God's love is such that sometimes he backs us into a corner where we have no options. We've exhausted all the possibilities except the one. All things have been placed in his hand. That means the ability for him to forgive you, to wash you, to cleanse you, to pardon you, to provide for you in the state you're in, to be restored. And if there's one message that I wish I could blast out, if the church is not preaching the message that Christ can and does, exactly what I just said, 
reconciling, restoring, and renewing. What are we preaching? Now look at this. The woman says to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well's deep. That's our carnal mind. You know, I'm giving an example of somebody else. I'm broke, and I can't fix my problem. I've got nothing to work with here. Go back. I'm, I'm asking you to lift each one of these and see some dimension of yourself in here. The woman is going to come up with objections because she lacks the understanding of what he's saying. We will come up with objections to what Christ offers us, all things in his hand, because we lack complete understanding of what is being said. Now, we don't need to understand the theory of gravity to understand when you sit down. You're going to sit down. You're not going to be sitting up. And likewise, you don't need some special theory, but you do need to see the dimensions of grabbing hold of, as I said, that open hand. Quit the objections. Quit the idea somehow. In your, maybe in your case, it's your backslidden. Then go and read Hosea 14, 4, where the Scripture says, I will heal their backsliding. He'll even heal that. Objections and excuses. You don't have anything to draw with. The well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? He gave us the well. Drank thereof himself, his children, his cattle. Again, lack of understanding. And I know from her frame, she didn't know who she was talking to. But get the mindset. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever, and that's my key right there, whosoever. Now, you may have things circled here, but I want you to circle that, because the whosoever in this case today is the whosoever drinketh of this water shall not thirst again. It's whosoever because all things are in his hand. Now, I don't know. I believe there's people who will reject this completely. They'll say, for those people who are sitting in the church, they'll say, well, I'm already past that point. I've already reached for his hand. But you still may be making objections to what God can or cannot do. And if all things are in his hand, then all things are in his hand. Not some things or a few things, all things. Your problems, your circumstances, your issues, your marriage, your children, all things. If I could keep a tally of how many parents say to me, my kid, my child does not want anything to do with the church or God. God, as a parent, pray for them. And this is probably the most difficult thing to do. Realize that Jesus, just like this woman who was coming to the well at a certain time and he was at a far place, Jesus knows exactly the frame that your children are in. Or maybe it's you or your spouse. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall not thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water... Oh, I'm sorry. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him, that's why my Bible's so marked up, shall, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. Now, you know, I'm not sure what Bible people read. Again, this is part of his love. This is not full, you know, you wouldn't read this and say, well, where does it say that he loves the woman? I don't read anywhere that it says, I love this woman at the well. <laughs> but he made a special trip just for her into a dangerous land very hostile to an enemy of the Jews, to a woman who, go call your husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, you've said, well, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not really your husband. Anyway, you've said, 
I said something right. Now, please step away from this for a minute. How many people have you seen trampled on either by the church or by Christian people who the minute they encounter your issues, you, you have the bubonic plague. You just stay away from that person. That's why I keep going with some of these people. Somebody said, why do you bother? Because that's why. This is the love of Christ that if I understand what I'm reading, sometimes and most of the time it's loving the unlovable. If you do things for people who love you back just in the, in the fleshly realm, the Bible says, what's so special about that? What's the big deal? And here we are looking at this woman who, I said she's not a harlot, but, you know, five husbands, and the guy she's with right now isn't either. And tell me that the people in the Bible, each one of these that are highlighted, from Rahab, the harlot indeed, tell me that's not the love of God to condescend to a very broken person and show love by sparing their household and their family. For one thing, obedience of faith. Hang this cord out your window. You and your family shall be spared. You can go through this book and see the love of God. And here I just gave you the example of Rahab, the obedience of faith, which I'm now translating into what I've quoted out of John and what I've quoted out of Matthew, which is if all things are in his hand, then you, by faith reaching for that hand, or to take his hand, or placing your hand in his hand, by an act of faith, I see it right here. You know, I'm sure many people in this woman's day came and professed many things. There were rumors of saviors and mystical people and special people, and every mother in Israel was waiting for every mother in Israel was going to have the savior, every one of them. The woman said to him, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me. And he doesn't say, like, Hey, if you'll listen to me today, <laughs> if you'll make a decision today. This word for believe, by the way, is, it's a Greek imperative. He says, Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And the Father has given all things by his power to the Son into his hands. He says, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. In, in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit that is as added in italics. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now why this catches my attention on the subject of God's love and my text, the two texts, is because I think sometimes we, especially you who have been in the church, we get conditioned to certain things. We, we maybe get a certain mindset of understanding God's love as simply what we have said. Yes, he loved me so much, and he loved you so much, he went to Calvary to die, shed his blood, that you and I may have life, and life eternal at that, because he's the first fruit of the resurrection, and we, looking to that day, I think we get conditioned into certain things. We get grooved into certain, certain things. And I don't, if it's for the few here or when this message replays on television, I want people to understand God's not looking at the size and measuring out your sin. He knows exactly where, like this woman, he knows exactly where you're at. He's not going to stop you as some would think, well, why doesn't God just put a stop to all the things I'm doing wrong and then I would be right with him? <laughs> really? 
I'm wanting the few, whether it be now or at a later time, to understand this is just one. Now I'm going to pick another one. I'm going to go just a few minutes more. And I, I, have, I have seldom uh, read from this because I've told you in the most extent, the oldest, most extent of John's Gospel, um, the eighth chapter, some of this eighth chapter is not in the oldest manuscripts. I've told that to you before, but certainly out of the, um, <clears throat> off the top of my head, I think it's the Oxyrhynchus papri. But some of those older manuscripts, we have a plethora, a very large collection of them, so this is not somebody's, um, somebody's hearsay, but firsthand, as I have examined the oldest uh, manuscripts that we have, there's a lot of doubt as to whether or not this passage of the woman taken in adultery, it appears, it appeared after the first century. This is what most scholars say, but whether that is or not, it's so well known and most people know it so well that I'm going to reference it. I referenced it last week on festival. This is another picture of God's love in Christ. Now, there's, there's a lot of when I say it's dubious because of the oldest manuscripts, there's a lot of credibility to the possibility that this did indeed happen, seeing the nature of how women were treated in the day and how pharisaical the rest of the book lines up with how pharisaical some of these people were that Jesus encountered. There's, there's good, um, it, it has a good fit to the time of its occurrence. <clears throat> but it says here, in chapter 8 and verse 3, the scribes, <clears throat> pardon me, and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I haven't said a word yet. That's why I love you. If she was taken in the act, it means they walked in, in the middle of that act. We'll come back to that in a minute. The man born blind, who did sin? The man or his parents? Never mind. Please, if you're not familiar with what I'm saying, it'll come at a later time. It'll all, all the parts will connect. So, <laughs> so Freudian, so Freudian. It says, they brought a woman taken in adultery. She was caught, it says, in the very act. And we don't know exactly how many of them were there, but I guarantee you, before they took her away, they probably that they found her in the act, so I don't know, they cover one eye? <laughs> you got it. And they're busy telling Jesus, now Moses and the law commanded us. Oh boy, see that's why I said, I'm, you're lucky I didn't write the Bible, because if I was writing it, I would put a few things in here, commanded us a lot of things that you guys just violated, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? They said this, they were tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground, italicized, though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him, let him first cast a stone at her. And whether or not you want to adhere to this belongs or doesn't belong. The concept is so biblical. Before you begin to judge, you better pull out what's in your eye before you go inspecting all the other stuff that's in everybody else's eye. He who has committed no sin, without sin, here, go ahead, here, here, here. here. He didn't hand it to them, but I'm, I'm adding to this. I'm embellishing. Now, in today's church... This is what I'm seeing. I'm just seeing there's an awful lot of people that are, they've got their hands up. They've got something ready to hurl. 
God's love. Whether this is here or not, I'm going to take it as it being here right now. God's love is such that at the right moment, a woman is brought. At the right moment, at the intersection of your worst disasters, or maybe it's the after fact and the aftermath of your bad decisions, God is right there. And I don't just need this passage to make my point, or the woman at the well, I would take a page out of the last chapter of John's Gospel regarding Peter, and forgive me if I go a little long, but so be it, regarding Peter's huge uh, fall of betraying Jesus, running off, and at the intersection where Jesus knew he would find him again, and here at the last chapter of John's Gospel, we encounter the love of God. We've, I've just looked at one woman from an enemy perspective, another that we don't even know what status she was. But we have one here who evidently was one of these chosen out from among special men. And this is probably what I've just put together. These three pictures show me Dimensions of God's love that are not just, oh, what he loves me, and therefore I know he loves me, and that comforts me. But in the framework that if all things are in his hands, that means time is in his hand. Think about that. The timing that he would be at this place at this particular time when this woman's coming to the well, or he'd be at this location where this woman is dragged out, or better yet, the intersection where... If you begin the chapter, the 21st chapter, you encounter here is um, all the disciples together with Peter. Peter said he was going fishing. Jesus just happens to appear right there, like, voila, it's magic. What I'm saying to you is if all things are in his hand, it means the timing, he knows where we are, there are times emotionally where we are so unraveled. We have, so, we have come so undone in our thinking and our ability to function. Never forget this because I think sometimes when we speak of all things being placed in his hands, we can, in his hand, we can take that as his hand is not extended to me. His hand may be extended to somebody else, but it's not extended to me. And I'll go back to say... Did Christ not read from the scroll of Isaiah, and it is quoted in Luke 4, where he speaks of the Spirit of the Lord being upon him, and part of that purpose was to bind up the brokenhearted, to free the captives. If you're under the bondage of something today, if something has you so weighted down, if your heart is weighted down, these are the things immediately by faith we reach for all things in his hand. But this particular vignette for me touches my heart because as the other ones show, and I said, please don't go around a measuring stick. What's worse, to have a woman who's almost a harlot, one who's taken in the act, or one who's completely betrayed and turned his back on the Lord? Don't try and measure and say, well, wh which one is more? Let's see who we would associate with because... In the big scheme of things, we go with the one who's a little bit better over here. Jesus doesn't do that. And what he does here, I think, is the most staggering. Because he not only restores Peter in this 21st chapter, beginning at verses 15 all the way through the close, 20, 22nd or 23rd verse, he not only restores Peter who I'm sure had such guilt and shame that he had abandoned his master, that he had committed this horrible act that was foretold of him anyway, but that God condescended to talk to him and commissioned him. I once preached a message on this. He called for him, and he commissioned him. He gave him a new... Standing. Now, I, 
I'm sure the rest of this gang might have said after this day and after the day of Pentecost when he got up and preached the sermon, I'm sure there might have been some of the group saying, yeah, Peter, what do you know? You, you ran out that night, so, you know, keep your mouth shut. Am I, like, identifying any people that you know that are church people? I hope I nailed all of them today because the point is we are not to judge who God will pour out his love on because it says he, God so loved the world, which includes also the unlovable, the, the ones that maybe will not respond, the whole world. If just one responds, but neither do I have to try and sell you God's love because it's everywhere. In every page of this book, everywhere. Now maybe your condition today is in one of these from someone who's outside of the church and you're looking in and saying, I could never come in because I'm just, I'm too bad. I've been too bad. Well, that's Christ's specialty. There's, no, there's never a too bad with Christ. There's, maybe there's a too bad that you didn't listen or there's a too bad that you didn't reach for his hand or there's a too bad that you didn't say, I should be here with the saints. All that means when we say the saints to God, that means those that have been set apart. Saints doesn't mean holy and floating to the rafters. Just set apart group of people. They've been set apart by God. They don't smell any rosier. In fact, some of you don't smell rosy sometimes. <laughs> Saint is just a set apart one coming into God's house and God coming into your house, which is the tabernacle, the body, to take up his abode and live there with you by his spirit. No matter how you want to slice what I'm saying, you come back to the love of God is displayed in many ways. And I pray today, not just for the one that I've really been trying to look at and aim towards, there's one precious key to all of this. Not some special key, and if you'll do these special acts or if you'll do these things, just by faith. And the beauty of that concept by faith is that mentally for some of us who wrestle with whether it's the sufficiency of Christ or as I mentioned bread enough to spare maybe the idea is it's not that there's not bread enough to spare it's your vision of the plentiful abundance of bread that is there you just can't see it you're like the man whose eyes haven't been completely healed. You see a little bit, but not 100%. Then you better reach out for that hand because all things have been placed in it. Healing has been placed in it. Where I started was provision and inheritance, wisdom and knowledge. And they all wrap up and funnel into the love of God. Not one dimension, but many dimensions flowing into that. The knowledge of what you need. Some people walk around, they feel like, they're alone. Well, maybe you ought to investigate the fact that by taking his hand, the very thing that you've been lacking, by taking his hand, you'll find all things. God said he will not leave us as orphans. He will not leave us comfortless. And I think sometimes the lack of comfort is the lack of reaching out and the lack of taking hold because he's more than able. The sufficiency of Christ as God the Father has placed all things in his hand. So I want to pray today that we will come to this in a fuller way, that we'll actually start applying the message. I, I don't want to deliver something to you and you say, well, that's nice, you know, the love of God is a very sweet thing, and, you know, off we go, and we're done here. But rather, if I were to pray something just like this, Heavenly Father, you know our frame. We are your children. We fumble around. We make mistakes. Sometimes we even lose our mind towards you. And as your children, we're reaching up today for your hand to help us, to lead us. The word says you're a counselor when we don't understand. Well, give us counsel. Everlasting Father, we thank you we thank you for the blessing and the provision of your word. We thank you for all things that you've given to your son. 
and placed in his hand. And we take hold of that hand together, placing our hand in his as he helps us up and on our way to him because he is the way and we thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's my message. Come on. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.